OK, ready to get started? Yes, no? Yes? All right. Um, so I'm Tim Hall. I lead product management for Hortonworks. Thanks for coming today. We want to give you a look uh, at HTTP 2.3, which we announced at the show. Uh, we're expecting general availability by the end of the month, assuming the quality team tells us we're done. Uh, so all the usual caveats. And we are going to do some live demos today. They're live. So you know, flying without a net a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, let's get started. So one of the key themes of the show, hopefully you heard from the keynotes this morning, and uh, for those of you maybe networking in the hall, is how Hadoop is empowering organizations to drive transformational outcomes. Um, wonderful technology that we're able to derive uh, significant business insight from, stored and process and analyze data at a very cost-effective rate, and we're just continuing to try to drive as much innovation into the community as possible to allow you to take advantage of all that stuff. And so two specific customer examples I just wanted to highlight. We have a retailer that's using the technology to build a 360 degree view of the customer, right? Originally, they had a lot of data silos and, and challenges. And what they decided to do is land that data uh, in Hadoop and then uh, analyze it on top. And obviously, they're doing things to reduce the cost of storage, number one, by eliminating the silos. Um, two, they're getting that single view of the customer now uh, across uh, multiple different channels where that information is coming in about the customer and what they're doing. They're able to leverage that in terms of their supply chain. Um, and now they're delivering things like pricing optimization uh, as well. Second example is a, a software security company um, that's protecting its customers from intrusions. And they're using Hadoop, um, uh, obviously, at a, a significant scale, um, uh, eliminating redundant storage systems that were costing them uh, millions of dollars uh, annually. They're, um, able to analyze all that information now very effectively and push uh, updates out to their customers looking for new and unique uh, intrusion and, and detecting those intrusions uh, as they occur. So just a couple of, a couple of uh, key examples. Now, what we announced on, uh, on Monday through press release and what we're going to show you today, um, three things critically that we've been focused on over the last six to eight months. Number one is a new breakthrough user experience. How many of you have been using Hadoop for more than a year? Okay. How many of you have been using Hadoop for less than a year? Okay. How many of you who have been using Hadoop for less than a year love the command line interfaces that we make available to you? Yeah, I see some smiles. Okay. So um, the point that we're trying to make here is we're reaching a stage of adoption where there's going to be a lot more people adopting Hadoop, and we'd like to make the experience of using it, interacting with it, and generally um, taking advantage of these breakthrough capabilities as easy as possible. So that's, now you can clap. Um, we're not going to we're not going to take away the command line interfaces for you expert users out there. So don't panic. I don't want to deprecate those things. We know people uh, with some experience know and love those things. But what we want to show you is where we're headed in terms of driving a better user experience and, and ease of use. The second thing that we're going to talk about is um, enterprise readiness. There's three qualities of enterprise readiness that we're focused on, security, governance, and operations. We're going to show you some of the operational capabilities through that breakthrough user experience. But two of the highlights we're going to um, go through today are focused on security and governance. Right? Security, hot topic. Um, when you have all this data within Hadoop, it's the honeypot for attackers. Right? They can come in. They, they would love to gain access to your cluster. So the idea here is what can we do to continue to improve the security of Hadoop overall? And we're going to show you what some of those investments have been over the last uh, six to eight months. And governance. As you land more and more data into, the, into your lake, how do you know what's there? Right? So when you have uh, individual uh, applications and use cases that you've uh, deployed upon initially, um, that you, you generally will have a good understanding of what data is there. But as we've uh, introduced Yarn as part of Hadoop 2 and allowed for multi-tenant uh, multiple use cases to run on the same cluster, now the question becomes what data sets are available and what new and unique things can I do with that data now that it's there. And so governance is becoming a, a very top of mind uh, issue and problem for customers operating these uh, types of systems at scale. Of course, it's not unique to Hadoop, right? We ha we've had data governance issues across the database sprawl and all kinds of files and other things that have existed for forever. But our, one of our focuses has been, how can we bring um, some sanity to this problem, given the pace at which things are evolving within the Hadoop ecosystem, and provide a common set of metadata classification schemes that you all can take advantage of for both discovery, lineage, and ultimately um, enhanced security as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then last but not least, for those of you who are Hortonworks customers, or maybe not, or would like to be, um, we're doing something to enhance 
uh, the value of our support subscription. So again, um, Hortonworks doesn't sell any uh, licenses. What we sell is a su support subscription to you annually. Every year is a voting year, as we like to say. Um, and our support subscription generally covers um, break fix and technical guidance. And one of the things that we're announcing as part of our proactive support is the ability for um, you to have a phone home capability, which means collecting information about your cluster configuration and operational statistics off the cluster, providing it back to our support team, and allowing us to analyze it and give you recommendations about how you might tune, optimize performance of your cluster for maximum value. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how it works in a minute. So starting with the breakthrough user experience, I want to give you some background. Back in December of um, 2014, so last year already, uh, we released uh, Ambari 1.7 through the community. Now one of the key extensibility points of Ambari 1.7 uh, was called the Ambari Views Framework. Now when you ever, uh, how many of you have ever developed a framework before? Right, the framework is sort of great, but it's not that useful till you actually have somebody using the framework, right? So, um, one of the challenges of introducing a framework is you, it's, you'd like to have something to show. And now we're actually going to show you what we've done with that framework itself. So while the framework was, uh, was landed in 1.7, a little bit difficult to demo. The general idea here is that we'd like to put a common user experience and open that up to the entire community. Open community, open source, and allow um, views to be built on top of that framework, not only by Hortonworks, but by our customers and our partners. And so the Views framework, again, uh, delivered by the core Ambari in 1.7 and now continue to be enhanced as we continue down the track. And now we're going to show you a number of views that we've built uh, for the different um, personas who will be interacting with the cluster. So in terms of what the framework actually provides, um, there's a, an Ambari server instance um, that hosts all the server-side resources that are written in Java. And then the Ambari web portion, which service, serves up the views, which actually can be composed of any type of uh, UI technology that you'd like. And in essence, uh, we end up with um, REST-based interfaces that are binding these two things together. So generally, um, and Jeff Spazzetti here is helping me drive this and going to do some of the demos, um, is the product manager for Ambari. Um, Jeff's background is actually uh, comes from building web portals. <laughs> Uh, among other things. And so one of the things that went into building the views framework was thinking about all the different deployment semantics and the, and the types of things that you would like to be doing with views. And so we've created um, the ability for you to deploy multiple versions of the, of the views themselves and multiple instances of them. Why would we do this? We may want to target different user communities. You may want to target um, the ability for one community to test out a new instance of a view or a new uh, set of capabilities before cutting the entire user population over, as an example. Um, so you can manage the accessibility and usage of those views centrally uh, and also upgrade and version them uh, very effectively. In addition, the deployment model. So one of the questions that we normally get around views is the fact that, hey, wait a minute, I thought Ambari was the thing for a cluster administrator. And now you're going to tell me that I have a whole series of views that a data worker could use to build, say, uh, SQL. And, it, and oh, isn't that going to slow down the uh, ability for the operator because it's all going through a single server? So one of the things that we've done is looked at the ability for you to, to decompose or decouple where the views are actually deployed. So you can have a Ambari server that's only serving the operational users, and you can s deploy in, uh, separate instances of the Ambari server to handle those data workers or any other uh, persona that you wish. Again, allowing some independence and scale out capabilities, including allowing you to bind to different uh, security infrastructures. So we even had a customer look at this example and say, hey, cool, I can build customer-facing views and secure them for that customer population using a separate LDAP and infrastructure than I would normally use for my corporate uh, instance. And all of that's possible with the Views framework. So hopefully I got you a little bit excited about what's, what's already been landed uh, in terms of the Ambari Views framework. And now we'd like to show you a little bit more about where we've taken this going forward. So in terms of operations and the breakthrough user experience, one of the key focuses here is, is to uh, make the life of Sam, our Hadoop operator here, uh, better. She already looks pretty happy as it is. Um, maybe that's because she's already using the, the, uh, the beta version of, uh, of uh, HTTP. Um, but the idea was to focus on easy setup and installation, customizing the dashboards, and um, rapid uh, provisioning and, and faster cluster formation. And so um, related to the easy setup and oh. installation, next slide, we focused on something called smart configuration. Um, the original version of Ambari 
had a whole laundry list of every configuration parameter known to man. And while that was great, because we exposed them all to you, um, it also created challenges, um, mostly because the, the way in which you filled out the, the parameters is they were freeform text fields. And this also allowed you the opportunity to uh, make uh, mistakes, uh, setting one parameter size too big when another needed to be adjusted in, in conjunction. What we've done is we've gathered up the most commonly used configuration parameters for HDFS, Hive, Yarn, and HBase, and we provided smart configuration panels for these using a modern look and feel, and we've pre-calculated ranges and use, uh, allowing you to use sliders to keep things within those ranges. And we've created the uh, dependency checks such that if you change one that has a dependent uh, value that also needs to be changed, that one will also change in conjunction. So we think that that's going to make Sam here extremely happy as she gets to use um, these new smart configuration uh, values. We think this is, provides a more guided, digestible, and opinionated approach for configuration. And then, of course, for all you expert users out there, you'll notice that there's an advanced tab where we actually give you access to all the configuration parameters just like you, you're used to. So we're not taking anything away. We're just trying to enhance the experience and provide you with a more guided approach. Second is we're allowing for customizable dashboards. Um, one of the things that landed with Ambari 2 was a, a brand new native metrics and alert subsystem. So we're no longer requiring you to use Ganglia or Nagios for alerts and metrics uh, underlying Ambari. Now we're taking, taking a step up. So um, what we're allowing is for you to, to take widgets and apply those widgets um, onto the dashboard, uh, even down at the component level. Um, you can also define your own metrics within the metrics subsystem and then build widgets on top of that. So there's out-of-the-box templates that Jeff's going to show you here in a minute, allowing you to create a personalized experience. And of course, um, the widgets can be reused and shared uh, across users. So because I promised a demo, uh, one demo with no further ado, Jeff is going to show off uh, Ambari 2.1, uh, which we're working on within the community now, um, and how we uh, are delivering this breakthrough user experience. All right, great. Uh, so what I've done here is I'm actually pointed to a cluster I've already installed. And I am looking at actually the HDFS service and the summary tab. So out of the box, Ambari installed and configured HDFS. And it went and preloaded some of these widgets on the page for me to see um, key metrics that, you know, over our experience, we've seen these are the things you want to see when you look at a Hadoop service. And so, you know, for people that come along, these six that are shown by default are great. It's, you know, I want those, but I actually want other ones. Because as we all know, Hadoop emits a lot of metrics about what is happening in the cluster and they wanted the ability to see things that weren't here on this page. So we wanted to give them the ability to customize that. So there's a couple things they can do. So first, um, you can go and actually add and remove widgets from this dashboard, because the library actually includes more than what came out of the box and were shown on the page by default. So here I have a couple other widgets that were pre-built into HDFS that I can go and add to this page, so I can have something about name mode operations and my GC count, and I can close this this uh, panel here, and now I actually have those widgets available. I can move these widgets around and relocate them. I can also go and take them away. So that widget browser is available for all operators, so they can really customize their dashboard when just by adding and removing things. So another op option they wanted was, um, I have all these metrics available. What if one of the widgets that are in the library don't actually satisfy the need, and I actually want to go and create a custom widget? So we give you the ability to go and actually create a widget. So you go and actually choose the type of widget you want. So whether it's a gauge or a graph or a template-based one or a number-based one, you can choose that type. And then actually go and browse all the different metrics that are being emitted from Hadoop and are available to you. And you can actually select metrics. So I'll go and take how many total files are actually in this cluster that I have here. Go and add that metric. And then I kind of get a preview of like really what's, what's going on inside of there with the total files. This is a very small cluster, obviously. Um, I might want to be able to see it a different way. So I can actually go and build up expressions, combine different metrics together, really kind of get it to look the way I want it to look when the widget's sitting there on my dashboard. So this is actually going to represent files in the thousands. I can go and click Next. And what I can actually do is now save this widget. And I can save it to my own personal library of widgets, because this is something I want on my dashboard. But I can also share this widget out with anybody else in the library. So they can go and grab this and put this in place. So it really helps enable the operator to go and customize his own dashboard, as well as share the widgets between other users that are, that are also accessing the cluster. And one thing to highlight here, um, all of this, and if you're, you know, if you're not familiar with the Ambari architecture, uh, under the hood, all of this is driven by what we call a stack. And 
you know, even though this is how it surfaces in the UI, these things are driven under the hood in a stack. So as people go and customize Ambari and bring custom services to Ambari, you can also define what these widgets are and extend it there too. So it's not just the end feature that comes in the web interface, it also all the way goes back all the way to the framework. So uh, switching gears and talking a little bit about configs and guided configs. So you know, as, as Tim mentioned, in previous versions of Ambari, we put a lot of power in people's hands. So Hadoop has a lot of configuration options. So every service has hundreds of options, and when you put a bunch of services together, you have hundreds upon hundreds of choices to make. And so we you know, really tailored over the past couple years to giving a lot of power to people. For the very experienced people who have been doing this for over a year, they wanted all those configurations in front of them. But as more and more people come on board, you know, and as we started seeing what are the best configurations that I should be using first over other ones, we said there's gotta be a different way to do this. We have to make it more prescriptive and opinionated and easier just to figure out what configurations matter most and how should I tune them. So what we did was first you know, change the layout a bit when it comes to configurations. So Ambari already was supporting configuration versioning and history and audit, but we actually changed the UI a bit so that the actual configurations themselves are driven by uh, tailored UI controls that are specialized around the actual value of the property. So the case here is where I'm gonna go and move node memory around, we use a slider bar. So it's a little bit easier to know that I'm actually moving memory around based on you know, moving from zero to some bound. And it's actually a little bit easier for me to see that this upper bound was also calculated for me. So it knows, Ambari knows about my cluster, it knows how many hosts I've in there, it knows about all the different services that are in there, and actually is recommending me to say, well, I know zero is the bottom, that's what I think the max is, and you can go and change it if you want, but I think there's actually still a recommended value you should have, and it actually gives me that choice. Um, I can always revert to that recommended value, or I can take this change, and it also told me, hey, if you're gonna go change that, you also have to go change this other configuration value, because moving that one up means your maximum container size moves up. So we also handle that dependency interaction for you. So we alert you that there's another configuration that you need to change to make, and you can actually go and see the details of because you made that one change, this is what we should also change, and you have the option to accept that or not, and then ultimately you can save this and um, you know, put it in Ambari in order to version it and then push out the config to the cluster. And again, um, the advanced tab actually has all the other configs that are still in kind of like a, you know, a raw form for you to have access to everything that is also possible beyond those that are on the settings tab. And one other key thing here is, this is all stack driven as well. So as people bring custom services into Ambari, they can actually go and deliver these uh, configuration, uh, this configuration UI experience from their stack um, as they plug it into Ambari. One last area to talk about, um, when it comes to the views framework, what we did with the views framework and starting to build stuff on top of that. Um, there are certain views we build and a little bit later we're gonna see a couple other ones, but there is one I wanna show right now. We actually built a view that is very operator focused and it's about managing capacity scheduler queues. So the idea here with capacity scheduler, you build up a hierarchy of queues and you divvy out the resources that Yarn has available across those queues. And building up a hierarchy of queues actually with Yarn has a lot of rules associated with it. Everything must add up to 100. You have to make sure if you move this one, that should also happen. And you know, the syntax for doing ACLs can be challenging uh, since it you know, has different things associated with it. We took all that logic and actually built it into this UI and actually built it as a view and deployed it so you don't necessarily have to give this interface out to all your users, you can give it to certain operators over other operators, but it actually tries to simplify it for people to say, looks like at this level of my queues in, in Yarn, I have engineering, marketing, and support. My capacities are divvied up that way. I can actually go make a change here. It realizes that I'm over capacity. I'm gonna have to take it away from someplace else. It tries to enforce those rules for me so that I ultimately can get back in compliance. And then since I only made a change to capacity, I didn't actually make any destructive change, it knows that you can actually go push this out without taking a restart. So it helps enforce that policy as well. So overall, trying to make you know, configurations easier on people and um, support or, or, and take the guesswork out of setting those configurations by you know, making the UI a lot more friendly. Okay, so for those of you who are out there like Sam, happy, look good, what do you think? Yes? Cool. Okay. Yeah, clap, clapping's good too. Um, last, last thing from an operational perspective is um, host discovery um, and speeding uh, cluster formation. So investments have been made uh, in Ambari um, specifically to make sure that we can uh, allow for uh, automatic expansion and uh, make cluster deployment uh, basically two times faster than it currently was. 
So bringing hosts to Ambari and then applying uh, the blueprint uh, capabilities on top of that um, typically took a, a, an extended period of time. And so we've been working with uh, some of our partners, uh, Microsoft <laughs> included, um, to speed cluster deployment for uh, virtual machines and things as you could bring those to the cluster and then applying the blueprint as a template right on top. So there's another session that will do a much uh, deeper dive on Ambari and all the latest and greatest capabilities on Thursday with uh, Sumit and Yusaku. Um, so for those of you who want to learn more about that. Um, so Thursday, 310 to 350. Um, so last but not least in the operations front, uh, we acquired a company uh, in, uh, in April called Sequence IQ. Um, Sequence IQ, a brilliant team of engineers out of Budapest that were focused on, again, automation for cluster deployment in the cloud. Um, and this technology, CloudBreak, how many of you are familiar with CloudBreak or have maybe used it already? Okay. So um, this will be part of the Hortonworks uh, Enterprise Plus support subscription when we GA it. Um, the GA is planned for just after the general availability of HTTP 2.3. And the, the general approach here is we want to take pick that, pick that blueprint for Ambari, choose a cloud, you provide your credentials, and launch HTTP in those environments. So the first three um, uh, cloud providers that we'll support, Microsoft Azure, our wonderful partner, um, Amazon and Google Compute, and then we're keeping the uh, OpenStack, which is the virtual deployment uh, or virtualized infrastructure deployment as a technical preview for now, and then we'll work on hardening that in the second half of the year. And uh, just to give you a sense of what CloudBreak looks like, I know many of you may have seen uh, the, the demo this morning that was done on the main stage. Um, basically, you know, enter your credentials after you pick the cloud, you pick the blueprint from the drop list, and then it, uh, CloudBreak gives you uh, feedback on what's happening within that cloud environment as the, the cluster is stood up. Second technology that was um, the Sequence IQ team built was called Periscope, which is actually listening to the uh, metrics that are being emitted from the cluster, and you can define scale-out policies, scale up or scale down, based on what's happening in terms of workload. Um, you know, essentially, if you're running out of uh, you know, um, CPU or disk, um, adding new nodes to the cluster. So wonderful ca uh, capability to speed uh, and rapid deployment and provisioning of HTTP into those cloud environments, and then you'll look for us to take that into on-prem uh, in the second half of the year. And then again, there's a session on CloudBrace with, uh, with Janos, who is the CEO of the company. Uh, and if you haven't seen him give a, a live demo, uh, it's always, uh, always fun. Uh, to watch him do that, um, and that's tomorrow uh, from 2.35 to 3.15. Um, last but not least on the, on the CloudBreak front and sort of the ease of, uh, of deployment, we're actually going to host an instance of CloudBreak on your behalf. So no software download. You can go right into the website, launch.hortonworks.com, um, <clears throat> and uh, go ahead and log in. There's a registration page, and we, uh, you can put in your credentials, pick your cloud, and launch from the set of blueprints that we provide. Um, so new experience that's coming. Um, we just have the login page at the moment, so it's up. Um, but you look for this to, to roll out in the, in the next uh, six to eight weeks. Now, I want to shift focus from uh, operations to uh, developers. Um, so another key uh, set of constituents that we need to focus on is improving the world of uh, developers. And these are people who are building uh, Pig Latin scripts, SQL builders, uh, browsing the files in the cluster. And so the idea here is what can we do to improve the life of, of this uh, attractive gentleman who's staring longingly into his laptop? So, um, <clears throat> so what we've done is we focused on building a, a, SQL, a SQL builder for Hive. Um, that includes not only the ability for you to build uh, that SQL query, but to uh, be able to do um, uh, optimization and analysis as well. So there's a visual explain plan that's provided as part of that. And if you're using the Tez execution engine, you can step down into uh, the, how that query is going to be um, distributed as a DAG across the cluster uh, and see how that actually executed all in one integrated experience. In addition to that, we um, extended the, or we're working on extending the support for Hive to include Union uh, as, a, uh, as a, a SQL semantic. And we're also allowing for um, interval types in expressions. So current date, current time, um, and also doing uh, arithmetic using um, interval types uh, in the SQL, uh, in the SQL uh, where clause. Uh, we've continued to con uh, progress on performance improvements, and that'll be another area that we focus on in the second half of the year. But to give you a sense of what the, the SQL builder looks like, um, it looks like an integrated IDE. Um, there's some tabs along the side there to step into different um, elements of the query, including the, the TES debugging. 
Um, you can browse the database tables and columns. Um, you can click on the explain plan button and we'll show you a little bit more of that in the demo in a few minutes. Um, as part of HTTP 2.3, we're also going to progress in terms of our support for Spark. Um, so Spark 1.3.1 will be supported. Um, this includes the new data frame uh, API. How many of you are using Spark <coughs> currently? How many in production? So lots of experimentation, which is good. Um, so our general strategy on Spark is to be about N minus one in terms of the current release version. 1.4 release candidates being voted on right now. Um, and we'll typically be providing access to a technical preview of the latest and greatest while supporting that N minus one version. Just seen in terms of the community speed and adoption, better to be a little bit uh, cautious in terms of uh, getting on the super bleeding edge. And we wanna make sure the technology works as stable and we can stand behind it. In addition, um, we've made some progress on um, uh, stream processing within HTTP, uh, specifically around Storm. Uh, there have been investments made to support high availability of the Nimbus server uh, and for it to support our rolling upgrade approach. Uh, again, one of the things that we focused heavily on uh, in the last version of HTTP 2.2 was landing um, a rolling upgrade capability, and Storm was uh, actually excluded from that previously, but now we're uh, providing support for Storm to do that role as well. And then one of the bigger deals is um, enhancing security for Kafka. And in a few minutes, we'll have Balaji Ganesan come up and show you how Ranger now it can be used to set up authorization policies for Kafka. How many of you are using Storm and or Kafka together? Okay, so now you can actually secure it. You won't have to use network level security to do that. You can actually define policies for the queues and topics. So big advancement uh, in terms of, of use of uh, Kafka. So now I wanna uh, ask uh, Rohit Bakshi, or Rob Bakshi as he's known, um, to come up and give you a little bit of a demo of um, the SQL Builder, the HDFS file browser, and the Pig Latin editor. Hello, everyone. I'm going to play the role of Robert today. I'm a developer, and um, I've been told that there's all this awesome data in Hadoop, in a data lake in Hadoop, and I'm supposed to make use of it. So I'm going to show you and walk through a uh, data analysis workflow. Um, so as part of my workflow, I, I want to load in some data sets, have it in the same place as my other data warehouse data sets that exist in the data lake. Um, I'm going to do some exploratory analysis, and then I'm going to get that into kind of the um, end data warehousing environment and then run join queries on top of that. That's kind of the flow I want to follow. To start with, and to actually execute on all of that, I'm going to be using Ambari views. So all this new stuff that's coming in HTTP 2.3 and Ambari 2.1 um, is the tool set that I can use to execute that entire workflow, all from the browser. So this is the Ambari file view browser. Um, and you can see here, as user Robert, I have my workspace. So I have my workspace where I've actually loaded in a data set that I want to explore and um, get into the data warehousing environment. So it's a CSV file with household power consumption values. Um, loaded it in, and here this is all do, being done with a Hive, uh, sorry, with the HTFS file browser view. I can, you know, if I want to load in new data, I can create directories from here. It um, will check for authorization policies. So if I'm logged in as uh, user Robert, so it's only gonna let me write load data into the space in HTFS that I actually have the policy given by the admin. Um, that's actually enforced by Ranger in this case. And so I can load, go in here, upload data, um, and really interact with the file system all through the browser in my workspace. So great, I have the data in here. Now I'm gonna start doing some exploratory analysis with it. So I'm gonna go over to the pig Latin um, builder view. Now for a whole, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with pig as a, okay, a lot of you, great. So pig is used by quite a few organizations for exploratory analysis. So you're doing data munging transformations, you're loading in data sets. Um, and you know, a lot of people did it first with a, the with a CLI and now with Ambari 2.1, we're gonna have a pig builder view. Here's an example of very simple getting started with script that I have. I'm loading in the data set. I'm gonna do some explore, exploratory analysis by looking at a set of 100 rec records um, and then dumping that to kind of see the values and understand my data set. What you can do with the pig um, builder view is that you can figure out, you can kind of identify your runtime engine that you're gonna run for the query in over here. You can execute the query. I can do a syntax check that will actually go through the syntax and make sure that my query is correctly set up, my script's correctly set up. Um, another cool thing, if you're into, um, into kind of more advanced exploratory stuff, you can, we have a whole set of pig functions that are available in the view um, that are kind of here and it's a suggestion and gives you the correct syntax. 
you can actually register and load in your UDFs using this view as well. This is an example, I have this um, view. You can look at all the, the history of all the different exploratory analysis that you've run. So as a user, I can have run something a week ago, go into it, look at the results, look at the results that I ran. Um, it's all there in the context of this view, all in one place for me as a developer. Great, so I've run this, I've, had, I've done some exploratory, I understand the data. I'm now gonna load it in to the data set and start doing joins with the other data sets that are available through the enterprise. With that, I go to the Hive SQL Builder view. Now this is something that Tim had shown as a demo, um, on, as a screenshot on one of the slides. With this, this is really a SQL environment. So all those, all those of you who are familiar with SQL um, Management Studio and other environments that let you interact with SQL, it's really the same thing here with Hive as the backend um, the backing SQL engine on Hadoop. So I have all the tables that I've created in different databases. I'm using the consumption database here. I loaded my data into some of these um, some of these tables, and you can actually explore the tables and understand the schema right over here. We're going to go look at um, a query that I had created to do some analysis, joining from two different tables, um, and then doing a group by. So slightly um, involved query that lets me do my analysis. This is something I had run before. So Tim was talking about this. Um, you can actually see the entire visual explained for this query. So this helps you understand how SQL will break down into different map and uh, map phases, reduced phases. This is all running on phase. So this is part, this is our interactive query, um, very low latency runtime engine for SQL, and this actually breaks it down and kind of explains what's going on every step. As someone, as a developer who wants to understand performance and optimizations, this is a great way to figure out what's going on in your query. And as the query runs, this shows you um, progress of the query. It shows you when the next data, data set's being joined in. Um, and you can actually see the entire view of how the query is going to be run. And you can do things like look at, his, look at history of all the different queries that you've run. If you have UDFs um, created, you can manage them through this interface, just like you can do with the Pig Latin Builder, as well as look at this, you can look at saved queries that you've run before, or that you've created and run. And so with that, you can actually see an end-to-end, -end how as a developer, you can run your entire workflow, loading in data, interacting with data in the system, doing exploratory analysis, and doing final analysis and join queries um, on all your data sets, all through one browser experience and one set of developer tooling available to you. So we're hoping to make Robert's life a little bit better as a developer <laughs> as well. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of, uh, of what we've invested in thus far. Um, now switching context into enhanced security and governance very rapidly as we're getting down to the end here. Um, so I'm going to have Balaji Ganesan come up and show you um, some of the enhancements that we've made to Apache Ranger. Um, again, Apache Ranger is our authorization subsystem uh, that we've been focused on building uh, for Hadoop. Um, essentially, centralized administration, tops down security policies for um, HDFS, Hive, HBase, Storm, and Knox. And now we're extending those capabilities in the latest release to uh, allow you to define authorization policies for Solar. Uh, for search and search indexing, for Kafka, and also for yarn queues. Yes. Apology, take Thank it away. You. So uh, Ranger, I mean, from a security standpoint, just like Ambari is for operations, Ranger will be our focus area for centralizing security administration. So one UI, one place you can go and manage security. So today in 2.2, we can we manage authorization for HDFS, Hive, HBase, Knox, and Storm. The, the idea is you can go into uh, Hive policy and go and specify what you want to protect in terms of Hive tables or columns. And so you can protect at a column layer, database layer, table layer, UDFs, app groups and users, and mention what the users can do or cannot do, right? So you can do select or load or create. And Ranger enforces those policy within Hive Server 2. There's a Ranger plugin running within that. So we have extended that policy management framework to add a new components. So what we did with Kafka, as Tim would have pointed out, is we work with the community to build security within Kafka. We introduced Kerberos authentication and authorization within Kafka. Now we, can, we have externalized that Kafka authorization within Ranger. So we can go and specify for a specific topic in Kafka, go and specify which group or user can publish to a topic, consume from a topic. And these are different actions that are available within Kafka authorization. So we work with the community to build those APIs first, then build a Ranger plugin which can expose those APIs. So there's a lot of background engineering work that has gone in uh, from that. So you can now secure Kafka topic 
uh, and not rely on just network level encryption. And similarly, the same work has been done on the solar side. So we work with the Apache solar community to build authentication into solar using Kerberos and build access control. Now in solar, we can now do access control at a collection level. So any queries coming into solar, we can control who can get access based on collections. We can give collection access, specific collection actions to a user or a group. And the permissions are based on whether they can query, they can update. And these are natively supported by Solar. We have externalized those with Ranger. Um, the other thing we have added in Ranger is the ability to have hooks for dynamic conditions. So we can not only do role-based static, role-based access control, we can add it in dynamic conditions. So we can add it, for example, IP address or bind to an IP address. So certain users from an IP address will be able to do certain actions. So this is based on a service definition model, so all of Ranger. And so you can easily define a service and define conditions based on that part. The other thing we have done is in, in 2.3 is Yarn. So within Yarn, there's the uh, capacity scheduler controls on who can submit to a queue. Now you can control that through Ranger. So you can go to Ranger and say for a specific Yarn queue, uh, this user or this group will be able to submit. And this opens up to any application which will be able to control. So we are not only doing data level access control, we can control at the queue layer. So we won't have rogue applications submitting data to a cluster. So with this, uh, with Ranger now covers pretty much a whole gamut of the cluster in terms of access control. And with Ranger also comes auditing. So any component that Ranger supports, we are able to audit. Now with Kafka and Solar, we can query all the audits are available within Ranger. We as a product, we are moving away from storing audits in the database and now going to store audits in HDFS and Solar. So the query tool you're seeing is being run out of a Solar backend. So Ranger will use a Solar as a backend for querying. The UI is very similar to what you have in 2.2. You can query and say, I want to see only Kafka audits, you will be able to see that part. Or you can go to the UI and say, give me all denied requests over the last few years. You'll be able to see a list of things. So Ranger provides all this query out of the box, but you can also take this audit and export it uh, to your own SIM system if you need it to be. And Ranger not only audits access, it also audits its own policies. So any change or update in policies uh, is audited by Ranger. So you'll have a clear audit trail of what's happened from a policy standpoint, um, as well as uh, what's happening from a user access standpoint. And finally, to wrap up, we have also introduced one of the functionality in Ranger is the key administration to support HDFS encryption. So we have taken the Hadoop KMS and now put it on top of Ranger DB and managed to Ranger. And this is going to integrate with the HDFS encryption that we announced. You may have followed the news in 2.3. So it's completely a different entity which can control encryption, different from Access Manager. So you have segregation of duties. But within Ranger, you can now control who can create a key. So there's a key manager aspects of what keys you can have add and which can be used in the HDFS encryption. And there's also authorization within the KMS. So you not only need access to the data level, you need access to decrypt a key, right? Decrypt the data. So there are actions that you can control at the KMS level that is now available to the Ranger. So it adds in a layer of security. You can actually block administrators from accessing if they don't have actions to decrypt the data using the actions here. So with that, you have the authorization in KMS, you have the ability to roll over keys, and you also have audit. So within audit, we can look at KMS and say, What's the audit coming in KMS? So we get the whole package with the Ranger integration. So again, a lot of work has gone in into making Ranger as the more robust security administration will we'll continue to work on that as we go. So hopefully you get the sense of what's coming at HTTP 2.3. Breakthrough user experience improvements for operators, developers, security administrators. And we didn't even get a chance to touch more deeply on governance, but the first arrival of Apache Atlas with metadata services for classification and high-level lineage is sort of the last piece. But hopefully you enjoyed that, and uh, thank you for coming.